Uh, Stephen holds a Bachelor of Science degree in aquatic biology, focusing on fisheries management and aquatic systems from Bemidji State University. He is a planner for the St. Louis County Environmental Services, and he's a quasi Iron Range native. Um, so he's held this position since 2015, and on a daily basis, the work includes the realms of recycling, trash, education outreach, and waste reduction. So very excited to learn from Stephen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I guess I'll expound a little bit quickly on the quasi Iron Range native. Um, my great grandfather moved to uh, the Esquagma area from Finland um, about 100 years ago. Uh, my dad grew up in Virginia. I was originally from St. Paul um, and at about fifth grade moved up to his childhood home, and I've been here ever since. So, yay. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I guess we'll get right to things. Recycling in Greater St. Louis County. Um, Greater St. Louis County being everywhere in the county boundary outside of the Duluth area. Um, I deal with uh, about 85% of the acreage of the county. Um, I think speaking in, the, in terms of square miles, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,200. Uh, which, fun fact, is larger than the states of Connecticut and Rhode Island put together. Wow. Uh, but I only serve about half the population, some 80,000 residents. So uh, when talking about what I do and what my department does in the county, uh, we travel a lot to uh, serve county residents um, in a manner somewhat different than what you would see in larger metropolitan areas. Um, the opening slide is a picture of our recycling facility, as you see it um, in well, just outside of Virginia, um, way over on the right hand side there. Um, you can see the water tower for the midway area between Virginia and Evelyn. Um, off to the left uh, would be the town of Gilbert. And where this picture was taken from is standing on top of the landfill. So, um, yep. Technical difficulties are a wonderful thing. So now you should be able to do it. Perfect. Well, a little bit of program history here. Um, the Environmental Services Department. Uh, is a rebrand of what was called the St. Louis County Solid Waste Department, which was organized in right around 1990 to take over a somewhat diverse and sparse grouping of township dumps, um, town dumps. Um, they closed a lot of those, consolidated things into one regional landfill, which is, oops, this picture right here, um, located just outside of Virginia, you can see just the eastern edge of town there. There's a nice new bridge that most people drive over on their way um, to Park Park and North. Um, the landfill road is just before you get to that bridge, and it's about a two-mile drive off the highway up to the landfill. Situated right below the landfill here is our recycling facility. Um, it's one of the most common questions and comments I get uh, about recycling in the county is, well, those recycling bins go down the landfill road anyway, so doesn't it just end up in the landfill? No, it does not. Well, I should qualify that by saying most of it does not. Um, back to program history here, the materials recovery facility, the recycling plant, um, commonly referred to as a MRF, MRF, uh, designed for what's called dual stream recycling. Most of you know that you have to separate your paper and cardboard from your plastic and aluminum, which is called pulp. Uh, we refer to it uh, as, um, by that language, that is your number one and two plastics, tin, which is a bimetal can, aluminum, and glass. Uh, for uh, so some numbers in the county, we average um, 
waste disposal of about 52,000 tons every year goes into the landfill. Um, the recycling facility generally processes about 5,000 tons per year. So it's about a 10% thing. Um, we estimate there's probably about 20 or 30% more um, in the landfill itself or what goes to the landfill that could be recycled. Um, but that it is, uh, that, that's part of my job is to make sure that people know all the, their opportunities to recycle, um, but I just can't get them to put stuff in a bag and then into a bin and then recycling facility. It's, it's really on them to do that. It's a voluntary thing. Oops. All right, so program reach. Um, over on the, well, your right hand side, my left hand, um, you see a great outline of the county. Um, every one of these red dots is where we have a recycling bin. Um, you can see that most of them are situated right down the, the poverty range, uh, but we do have quite a few in outlying areas. Um, we have over 55 drop off locations. About half of those are located at other solid waste facilities. So the transportation between here and Babbitt, uh, the sedan canister site. Uh, there are, uh, the other half of those are unmanned drop-off locations. Uh, I think the one for the city of Ely is right over on Cemetery Road. Uh, used to be on the south end of town and now it's moved up there. Um, we also, Offer recycling opportunities to nine area schools, area being the county. So let's see the Ely Public Schools, the newly reformed Rock Ridge Public Schools, uh, the Cherry, we've got the Vermilion Country Schools, uh, Mountain Iron. Um, we, we try to do our best in order to promote recycling as much as possible. Uh, so that's our roll up program where people bring stuff to our bin to drop off. In a parallel stream, uh, the cities of Virginia, Mountain Iron, Eveleth, and Hibbing have a curbside program. There's a state statute uh, that governs cities, uh, their requirements to offer a curbside program. And I think it's somewhere north of 10,000 residents. A city has to offer some kind of recycling program. Um, the only one that does that or falls into that is the city of Giving. Uh, the other three operate as part of their public works program, um, but they really don't have to. I like that they do, um, but they don't have to. A um, little bit of perspective here. Um, I, I really love this, this figure. You see how big St. Louis County is, uh, driving from Duluth up to Capitogama, um, it's about 135 miles. Uh, if you take the county as a whole, drop it down into the Twin Cities, um, it's about 135 miles from Duluth down to the state capital. And when you take a look at how much area that we cover compared to the metro, um, kind of puts it in perspective. Um, the, everything that we have to, uh, and every place that we have to cover with not nearly as many residents. Um, this is a little grainy to see, but uh, this is one of the uh, ideas of just how many sites we have around the county for recycling. All right, getting into the nitty gritty of things. Uh, Individual material, um, cardboard, or in my terminology, it's old corrugated cardboard or OCC. Uh, the, this category is specific to the type of cardboard that has a nice little wavy bit right down the middle of it. Uh, when people bring cardboard to us, we really like that it's flattened and cut into two foot by two foot pieces. Um, that is mostly because in order to process it at our facility, we can't have giant four by eight sheets of cardboard uh, trying to get into our baler or through the processing line. Um, it also maximizes space in our recycling bin. 
if you throw a, a cardboard box in one of our bins and it's not broken down, you're taking up a lot of airspace. Uh, so we really like that people flatten their cardboard. Uh, a couple other things about cardboard that we really like to see or not see. Um, we don't like when cardboard comes in soaking wet. Um, it can still be recycled, but we take a little bit of a hit from our end market because they will check the moisture content on, on that and we get paid by weight. So if it's wet cardboard, heavier cardboard, and they factor that into their payment scheme and we get less money. Uh, wax co coated cardboard. Um, that's something that is not accepted at the end market. Um, they can't deal with the wax coating in their, their process. So we kindly ask people not to recycle wax cardboard. What an example of something that comes in a wax cardboard box? Anyway? Honestly, I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> because it's been a long time since that's been an issue. Okay. But yeah, um, history has told me that that's still out there somewhere. Yep. So yep. I don't make a note of that. Um, pizza boxes. They're great cardboard. Um, <laughs> However, the food and grease um, that ends up as residue on the cardboard wreaks havoc with an end market process. So um, we ask that you tear off the top half of a cardboard or of a pizza box because usually that doesn't have a, any um, residual on there. You can recycle that, the rest of it into the garden. Uh, question back there, yes? Yeah, not the box something um, new. I've heard about that, however, um, I kind of have to play nice with my end market. So until such a time where they tell me it's okay, uh, I will continue to uh, put out the education to folks that please don't do, do that. But no. Um, but like I said, if that top half is clean, rip it off and throw it in the recycling. <laughs> yes, sir. You answered me too quick. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, how come Ely doesn't take cardboard and will it take cardboard in the future? Well, probably not. Uh, because most people bring their cardboards to the Northwoods transfer station where it is put into a baler uh, and they deal with a lot of cardboard there. Um, it's more economical to do that than to send a cardboard bin up to Ely. Um, and there it would get, it would need to be changed out uh, much quicker than it, than what we offer at the Northwoods Transportation. And that's the one down? Uh, down Ely. Ely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, question back there and then I'll get to the yeah, it looks to me like down there, they have bales of cardboard just sitting out in the weather. Yeah. Doesn't that make them wet and less valuable? Only the outside. Okay. And when an end market does their moisture test, they actually drive a probe into the cardboard. So um, think of it like a hot pocket. The outside is nice and crispy or in this case, really wet, the inside is fairly dry. Um, and cardboard does a pretty good job of shedding water. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Just a mm -hmm. I think the vendor that's buying from you. Well, um, I've actually got a slide for all the different products later, so okay. I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> New category is mixed paper. Um, that is everything from your cereal boxes to a phone book to uh, um, your normal mailers. Um, all of that would be considered a paper product because that all goes to the same um, end market. Yes? So, I'm sure there's a piece of Yes. No, you don't. Same thing, same thing with the uh, um, mailing envelopes. 
like what you get a credit card statement did and has that nice little window, you don't have to do that. Um, mostly because at the paper product and markets that we work with, their, uh, their method uh, begins with shredding that paper into kind of finer things before it turns into a slurry. And the, the little plastic bits end up floating to the surface and it gets skimmed off. I don't see it listed there, but the, the common packing material anymore and egg cartons are kind of the same thing, I think. Is um, they're considered paper? No, they are not. And, and I'll, be, I'll address the egg cartons later. Oh, sorry. The, the question was on egg cartons, uh, whether or not they're accepted uh, recyclable product. Um, and that is something, something I will touch on later. Including the, what's in packing boxes, which is a, seems like a paper material. Yes. Uh, in uh, the different shapes. There is, there is some wiggle room there. If it is an actual egg carton, no, it's not recyclable. If it's like an expanded paper thing with some glue and whatnot, that would be considered recyclable because it, it's a different thing. Um, let's see, getting back to this a little bit, um, newspaper, office paper, all of this stuff. Uh, the big thing to, uh, to touch on here, I don't think there are many phone books in the area that are over two inches thick. Uh, if there's still a phone book in the area. Uh, but, but anything over two inches thick, we do ask that it's ripped into a, something that's thinner than that. Question what about staples? Staples. Um, how many staples are you putting in a piece of paper? Well, magazines, for example. Yeah. Um, so I've been taking them off. Okay. Wow. That, I, I don't mean to be mean. Um, that's a bit of a waste of a time, and we don't require that you do that. Now, if a piece of paper is more staple than it is paper, um, that's another another topic to, to cover. Um, let's see. So junk mail, again, talking about that little window there, um, you don't have to worry about that cellophane in there, it's a non issue. This paper continues. Um, a small list of notes. Um, so frozen food boxes. There are a number of boxes that for frozen food that have a wax or plastic coating in. Uh, we cannot accept those. Let's see, uh, wrapping paper, tissue paper, that uh, wrapping paper in particular, it's got another coating on it. There's such little amounts of paper in there and, and markets don't want it. Uh, construction paper and egg cartons, but they kind of both fall into the same category, uh, more or less, so the construction paper a little differently. So I'll address your egg carton right here. That is not considered a recyclable product because by the time paper reaches the stage of life where it becomes an egg cart, the paper fiber is so tiny. Every time you recycle a piece of paper, the fiber gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So once it reaches an egg carton, it's so small that the next time they go to recycle it, it disappears in the process. However, egg cartons are compostable, the paper ones. Um, you just throw them into your compost bin, shred them up a little bit, uh, or use them to, to get your seeds planted for the next year. Um, they, there are ways to reuse them. Construction paper, kind of a similar thing. The paper fibers are very thin. Um, most of the time, construction paper is also used in conjunction with crayons um, or other things, and that kind of renders it unrecycled. Yeah, question? I want to get to the construction paper. Yes. Uh, Cardboard. Um, I recycle as much as I can to put it on the ground to press the leaves. Yep. But there are certain types of cardboard. It's not a wax coating, but I know that I um, have those fancy pictures you want to put paper. Is it kind of glossy? It doesn't keep. Are those the types of cardboard that you know that I'm talking about? Big state, I would say. Do not break them because uh, I'm not 100% sure about them. But if it's something that doesn't decompose readily, 
um, it would cause a, a trouble with the end product that you said when, when it comes recycling. Oh, let's see. About paper plates. Again, usually they have a waxy or a plastic coating. Unfortunately, they are not considered recycled. Now we get into the fun stuff, metals. Um, tin, um, or what's also referred to as a bimetal can, usually a steel and a tin combined. Um, Thank you. Those are recyclable. No need to remove the, uh, um, uh, paper. the paper on it, yes. Um, uh, Usually when they go to recycle a tin can, it gets melted down and that paper is gone. Uh, then so that's that's ferrous metal. The non-ferrous, the aluminum cans. Um, I really like aluminum cans. Um, from the day you throw it into your recycling bin and it reaches my facility to 90 days later, it is generally back on a shelf somewhere. And it is the only thing that is a hundred percent recycled. In the process, in recycling process, turning it into a new raw material for a manufacturer to use, there's usually some sort of loss. Aluminum really doesn't have that. It's nearly a hundred percent recovery rate. So you melt down aluminum, turn it into something new. It's almost a one-to-one -one thing. Notice some craft breweries have the type of wrapping around the can that you take off. Mm -hmm. Is that valuable? Is it necessary? Unknown. Okay. But that's not something I've run into or had a question about. I prior to the question, does that mean can I put the paper off from the cans in the paper? It's paper that I put in the recycling. You know, if you can tear it and it's paper, I think it'd be okay. Uh, if not, it's a small fraction of a residual and our end markets have never said anything about it. Top things, they're okay, too, leave them out of cans. It's aluminum, I'll take it. Oh, the, the question was about pop tops uh, on top of the can. Um, you can recycle those as well. They're aluminum too. Did you have a question, sir? No, the same question, the taps. Very good. The taps are recyclable? Yes, they are. Why do so many people put those separately? Um, mostly from my experience, it has to do with fundraisers. Um, like the, I remember as a kid in the Twin Cities with the Ronald McDonald House uh, um, at school, it, it was a competition to see who could collect the most pop tops. It's all aluminum, um, so it ends up basically in the same place. Yes. How much are you willing to pay them? Pretty good. So. Uh, so the question was, uh, how clean do cans have to be in order to recycle? To be perfectly honest, they don't. Uh, but the folks at the recycling facility really appreciate it if there's not a whole lot of food contamination in there because they deal with squirrels, chipmunks, hornets, all sorts of things. If, if there's food waste there, um, the critters will come. Um, so if you don't mind giving it just a, a cursory rinse, um, depending on how long you and where you store your recyclable, um, if you keep them in your house for any length of time, um, you probably want them a little clean. Um, I do the same, um, but you really don't have to clean them out. But don't get in there with a spatula. Um, that's all. Okay. So. Um, here in the county, we only accept number one plastics and number two plastics. Uh, a long time ago, we only took the ones that have a, had a neck on them. We don't worry about that anymore. Uh, the, the number does not, uh, the, well, the number in the nice little triangle there does not denote that it is recyclable. The number corresponds with the type of plastic that it is made of. 
So you see a one that is uh, PET, it's a polyethylene trichloride, I think, tetrachloride, yes. Um, and the number two is a high density polyethylene. Um, they're very stable resins. They're easily recoverable, easily reused. That is why the per ton value on them is very stable. And it is worthwhile for us to collect those and sell to an end. Uh, going back to the acreage, the, the square miles that we have to cover, um, everything comes down to, believe it or not, to money. Uh, we, and environmental services is what's called an enterprise fund. So we get no general levy tax bill. Everything uh, that our department offers is funded through service fees, which are, are on your property taxes, and tipping fees at the landfill and transfer station. So we kind of have to watch our pocketbook. Uh, we can't go over budget on something and say, ah, oh, we'll just grab another $10,000 from the general. Um, yes, question back there. Number five plastic. Uh, that, that's an interesting one that uh, I'll get to just a little later, okay? All right. So. Uh, also, caps on all the bottles, they're okay? Yes, they are. Um, generally, the caps on a bottle, there we go, um, it's the same, believe it or not, it is the same type of plastic. It's, uh, it, it, you can really tell that on like a gallon of milk. Uh, you can easily tell that that's the same type of plastic. It's a little harder on your pop bottles, mostly because the process of making a pop bottle is an air injection. So it spreads that plastic out really thin. But before that happens, it is the same um, texture and thickness as the cap itself. Um, so screw it back on. And usually what I like to do is squeeze the bottle down a little bit and then screw the cap back on and save it. Uh, actually at our facility when things get bailed, they end up under pressure and sometimes well, caps just start flying all over the place. So, so compressing it a little bit reduces the amount of air in there. Uh, I have one more thing. Yes. Now, so the water, plastic water bottles, they can buy them by the dozen. Yep. They, they have a strip that is, is around them. I've been cutting off that strip. Uh, are you talking about the uh, kind of the the plastic yes, thing? The, you know, the bottled water that you buy. Yes. You go to the mm -hmm. I now take that strip off because it's loose. I just put that strip yes, you on. Can. It's the same type of plastic. And there was a question far in the back. Okay, um, caps uh, on bottles. Uh, let me go back here. There we go. Um, we cannot crank the cap down all the way to create a seal, um, but the process that at our recycling facility, and I've got a picture in here later about that, is all done by hand. So if there's a bunch of products coming down the line, um, the guys aren't going to stop to grab one cap. So it's my recommendation that you either screw it back on or with those milk jugs, um, shove that cap right in there. Uh, it'll rattle around a little bit in your house, but it makes it a lot easier for them to grab it. Yes. I don't know if you're going to talk about them separately, but in recycling centers, one of the most abundant things it seems anymore is the plastic that is sold with vegetables and, mm -hmm. and, that, and bakery goods and all of those things. That, that's usually the number five. So uh, I'm going to cover that shortly. Yes. So since I can't drink a whole bottle of wine by myself, I do these little individual single serve. Mm -hmm. What do they call it? Mm -hmm. So you can't drink a whole bottle of wine. Thank you. 
that if you really want to, you can pull that off, but you don't have to. Um, usually, uh, I'm assuming that that cap is aluminum. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's something that uh, our sorters would probably not grab. Um, so, if you had maybe some other aluminum cans or something and could jam that in there, um, then it would then it would make it. But uh, otherwise, if it was just on its own, probably not. No, no, I wouldn't worry about that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, like uh, I alluded to earlier, that triangle does not necessarily mean it's recyclable. Um, the numbers, again, indicating those resin codes, we usually just grab those top two. Uh, however, getting back to the question about number fives, um, number fives are a polypropylene. They end up um, coming to us mostly as dairy products, um, cottage cheese, yogurt, other things like that. Uh, historically, uh, in the before times, pre-COVID, um, we always said that those weren't, uh, those weren't acceptable because uh, market forces always told us that the, the volatility of what it was worth per ton fluctuated on a daily basis, and we couldn't justify taking it. Since COVID, um, there's been a lot of money, both federal and state and private industry, invested into number fives, um, where that value is starting to stabilize. And right now, uh, I'm actually doing a pilot program in my facility to see what what kind of volume we're getting for number fives uh, that people are already putting in there thinking that they are recyclable in the county because they've got the recycling in the triangle on them. So I'm going to throw them in there. And if I lived in the Twin Cities, I could recycle them down there. Why can't I do that up here? Um, so we're working on that. And hopefully in the next couple of years, I'd love to be able to tell people that I accept them as part of my regular process. Um, but that's still some time in the future, uh, but but there's a good indications that it's going to be a positive. So thank you for asking about number five. That's one of my still thoughts. <laughs> Another question in the back. Well, should we should we throw in our number fives to up your numbers? Your <laughs> officially, no. <laughs> because. Um, Again, going back to rules and state statutes, if I advertise something as recyclable, then I have to take, I have to sort it and find an end market for it. If I don't, and we just do this pilot project, I can do that. Uh, I can, I can take it. If we sit on it for a little while, that's that's okay. Um, if we're short a, a couple sets of hands at the recycling facility and it ends up going into the landfill instead, um, yeah, that's a little bit of a bummer, but I'm not breaking any rules. So wait for me to actually officially say that I'm taking it. Right. Unofficially do it. Yeah. <laughs> Question. Yes, you didn't hear that. Yes. Yep. So um, you see, that we've got numbers one through seven. There's actually 13 different numbers. Um, but usually, anything above seven, you only find strictly in industrial purpose. It's not something that's commercially available. Oh, let's see. There we go. Glass. Um, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with glass. It's recyclable in the sense that if you have a solid ball canning jar, um, I'd love for you to reuse that. As soon as it comes to me, um, it's a dirty process. Reason being, uh, 
change that next. Uh, no. uh, I'll jump ahead of myself here a little bit. Glass. Um, there we go. Um, they recycle it differently. It does not end up going to an end market. All the glass that comes to us from St. Louis County gets thrown into a pit and crushed up, and we use it as an aggregate replacement. We call it glass five, uh, and use it to, to fill any potholes and store up any roads at our facility. Uh, works great for that. To try and sell that to an end market, um, not only would we, we be giving it away, we would then have to pay somebody to come and take it. Uh, and that is not a venture that we're looking at exploring at all. But like I said, Glass 5 uh, in most of our facilities, especially down at the landfill, if you drive around there and you see the, the gravel sparkle, it's glass. All right. So why, why not drinking glasses? Um, generally because that is uh, it's a different method of making a glass. Uh, like if, if you drop a, a drinking glass and it shatters, you see how uh, the, the chunks of it are all sharp uh, and, and everything. With the, a lot of the other glass, um, well, I, I, I guess your standard glass bottle would do the same thing, but it, there's, there's something in there that uh, is, Better for us than than not. <laughs> Again, uh, glass. Like I said, love hate relationship. I don't want to go too far into it. Uh, um, but ceramics. Um, some people say they're a kind of glass. They actually go in with demolition at it, at any of our county facilities. Light bulbs um, are too thin. They cause more trouble than they're worth uh, in our recycling effort. Um, window glass um, is cumbersome and is downright dangerous. When you try and throw it into a metal bin, those shards can go anywhere and everywhere, and um, no small percentage is into you. So no window glass. All right. So now that we've covered the topics or the, the types of material we take at our process, um, here's what happens when it, it actually reaches us. Um, all the roll off bins, that, as you see them at our unmanned locations and our manned locations, come to us on a roll off truck, um, which goes over a scale. Uh, everything that comes into and goes out of the landfill complex is weight um, because I get to do a lot of math about what remains behind. Um, so in terms of, say you go to the Ely drop off and one of those bins is full, um, that'll get called in to our dispatch or our contractor's dispatch. At that point in time, they have 48 hours to get up there and change out a bin, which can be somewhat um, annoying to residents because they would really like to drop off their recycling. Um, but being as it's full, do uh, you really need to take it back with you? If you put it on the ground next to that bin, that is considered littering, and that's a $700 fine. And I'd really rather not have to do that. Uh, but uh, that, that's why sometimes if you go there and a bin is full and it hasn't been changed out yet is because of that contract language saying that they've got 48 hours. Because again, uh, we're covering a large area. They've only got, I think, three trucks running all over the county. So it takes. Yes. It drives me crazy when I see people putting their plastic into a plastic bag and throwing it in there. What do you do? What do you do? By that point, once it reaches that bin and that plastic bag makes it to our facility, um, as part of the sort process, the first guy on the line, I've got a picture of the sort line later, um, that first guy will grab any plastic bag that's come up the belt. 
then depending on how many he collects over a sorting time, um, they'll take the last 15 to 20 minutes of that sort um, to tear open all those things. Plastic bags are a real nuisance, <coughs> and I would rather not see them anywhere near recycling products. Uh, if you have to use them, please don't tie them shut. Um, leave it open. Good question, yes? Are you talking about cat litter? Um, then please don't put it in the recycling. But that would go into the garbage. So, um, again, talking about how we kind of have two things concurrently. We've got the roll off program. Um, above there are a couple pictures of the city of Virginia's recycling truck that drives around the city of Virginia and picks up um, every other week. Um, they've, they've broken the town into, I think, eight or 10 different zones. So depending on where you live, changes which day that you put your recycling up. Um, top one happens to be the city of Evelyn. Um, I see him once a month. That goes by my front door. Uh, the city of Mountain Iron has the same general idea. They've got a, a pickup truck with a box on the back where they can throw all their cardboard. And then uh, there's a number of compartments in the back where they sort all of their, uh, everything they pick up curbside. So once it comes to us, it ends up going across the scale full. They go and drop it at the facility, drive back around the scale empty. That gives me how much material they brought in. Um, when, the, when they go to unload, um, they actually unload at four different places uh, at our facility. They've, uh, there's one tipping floor for paper, one tipping floor for that core material, the pit for glass, like I talked about, and a separate tipping floor that's purely for cardboard. And here's some pictures of that. So we've got our paper on this end. You can just see a little bit of the plastic. Um, this area being for cardboard, that's actually right next to the belt that goes directly to the bailing. A very minimal processing required if uh, somebody brings in a load that's entirely cardboard. Uh, and then I actually don't have a picture of the glass pit, but it's a pit full of broken glass. Don't walk there. I have a question. Yeah. Environmentally, are those rooms, uh, are workers in those rooms? And if they are, is there ventilation? Well, the ventilation that you see are these nice big 26 foot overhead doors. There are a couple fans on the sides of the building, it's kind of hard to see, um, but especially this truck, um, it's a large open area back behind it. There's a sort room kind of right where that picture is taken from. Um, otherwise, it, it, it's a large open facility that's heated. This side um, is not heated. There's a, a wall, actually this wall right here. Um, is a separation between the unheated side and the heated side. Um, so there's a fair enough of environmental controls where they're not breathing in diesel fumes or anything like that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Yep. Um, the crew there does have a multi gas meter uh, where they check especially confined spaces or anything like that. We are regulated by OSHA. Yes. And have had inspections over the past. Um, so, what happens when stuff gets to us? Like I said earlier, the cardboard tipping area is right next to the belt that loads directly on into the baler. Um, very minimal sorting. The guys just push. I shouldn't say guys because there is one gal that works there. Um, so they, they will do a cursory sort, so to speak, as they're putting that cardboard onto the belt, they'll pull out anything that doesn't belong there. Uh, the sort line process, um, they have two different ways that they set that up. When they're sorting core material, the plastic, tin, aluminum, they do what's called a positive sort. So there's six people standing over this belt. Um, as material comes up the line, they take up everything that they want. That's positive, so you're, you're keeping what you want. 
a negative sort, it's just the opposite. When paper goes up that belt, they'll take everything off that they don't want. Uh, yep. You said you have a team of six doing it at one time? Yes, um, and here's a good picture of that. Uh, there's actually um, five guys in this picture. Um, the two closest ones are handling aluminum. The one right behind this guy is grabbing the number one plastics. And then that gentleman and another one behind there are dealing with the number two plus. And the guy uh, behind here is the one in charge of grabbing uh, plastic bags as they come in. He throws them into this corner. And like I said, they pile up sometimes right to the ceiling. And then they have to take some extra time to sort all that out. Yes? Wait, but I got a couple of questions about mm -hmm. the economics of this. Yes. So in the operation of these local stations, mm -hmm. is all of the, you absorb all the costs of the contracting and are there local jurisdiction costs? That's one question. And the other one deals with the ones that are staffed. Mm -hmm. who, who staffs them and what is the advantage to you to have one staffed over not having it staffed? Well, the staffed sites are at our um, regular garbage collection facility. So uh, we, we cite that there. It's a nice one stop shop there. Um, the attendant at those man sites uh, does take some time to pack those bins a little denser than an unstaffed facility. Um, the unstaffed facilities um, are just out there. They rely on the public to do the right thing. Um, talking budgets and financials, uh, everything is within uh, environmental services. There's no local money going towards that. Uh, and we do absorb those costs to give you just a, a quick primer on it. Um, last year's contract for the operation of the facility in the Holland just about eclipsed nine hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. That's is that environmental services. Is that a a private company? No, that is a Department of St. Louis County. We're actually organized underneath Public Works. But like I said earlier, we're an enterprise fund, so our budget works differently than the, the general county budget. Uh, getting back to said budget, $955,000 to operate the facility. Um, the value of the product that we sent out to end markets last year was actually a bumper year for us, to the tune of $789,000. Historically, we've only received, well, prior to the, this last year, the most we've ever received for materials has been in somewhere around $400,000. So we're subsidizing this program quite substantially um, through tipping fees and service fees um, as a way that they keep this material out of the land. So it kind of works hand in hand with whenever you throw a bag of garbage away, uh, a small portion of that money does go towards funding this, this program. Is that, is that overseen by the county board of commissioners? Commissioners, yes, um, the, there is the solid waste and septic committee that we do on a regular basis. So yes, uh, we are overseen by that, yes. I assume you're not gonna talk about the non-recycled separation, the um, I mean, uh, appliances, the Metals, well, the uh, construction materials all get separated. Um, yep, the uh, in the Northwood site, uh, as an example, uh, the scrap metal pile ends up going to a scrap dealer um, just outside of Virginia right now. Same with appliances. Uh, the demolition material ends up going to General Waste. But it's a landfill in Kiwa uh, that does not get recycled. Uh, but but a lot. Of, the vast majority of other things, too, the tires, things like that. What about the, um, the plywood and by and like that? Yeah, the, that goes to an industrial waste landfill uh, because we don't do any kind of sorting there. 
because uh, we're, we're losing our shirts as it is with this recycling program to do any kind of uh, materials recovery and demolition. Uh, we tried that once. And there's a reason we tried it once. <laughs> So um, the composting that we offer or, or that we promote here in the county um, is individual. Uh, I, I try to offer as much support with, with folks uh, as I can when it comes to giving you an idea of what would work best for you. Um, we do offer reset or composting bins, usually, especially early in the year uh, for people to come in and purchase to do in your backyard. Uh, to do a larger commercial style composting program, especially like what you see in Duluth, um, is completely not feasible for us, um, primarily because of Paul. To aggregate that, every, that material to one central location where we can compost it, um, we'd be throwing money at it constantly with no return. Yes. Is, is Privately, or no. do you say the uh, county owns the land? Yep, uh, there is about 680 acres there uh, that comprises the recycling facility and the landfill and, and the buffer area. Mm -hmm. So the oh, the the landfill itself has been there since 1990. Uh, the recycling facility since about 2000. Sorry, landfill there since uh, around 1990. Is when it opened. Um, currently, there is about 25 years of capacity left at that landfill, and we are in the process of uh, doing a modification to our permit to extend that out another 75 to 100 years. And then, when there's a sale, you know, a purchase of that land, mm -hmm. do you have a title giving you know, giving an okay to develop it? Or? When the landfill reaches capacity and we close it, we retain ownership of it for 20 years as a, a post closure uh, system. Once it reaches that 20 years, that property is sold to the state of Minnesota to enter their closed landfill program. Uh, it will essentially never be offered out as a commercial, especially the landfill itself. Some area around it uh, may uh, be offered somewhere. Um, However, the only other place, that, the only other entity that might take it is RGGS, which is a mining speculation company. Uh, our lands are surrounded by RGGS land. Like for the reclamation, is there a reclamation statute that when you leave a land, yes, right, do you um, be a part? Do you create a tree? We create a, center, a tomb for waste. So there will be a, there's a plastic cover or a plastic liner underneath the landfill uh, as we build it. And then when we close it, we put another plastic liner over the top. There's two feet of soil. And it, it essentially looks like one giant hill. Um, we're actually looking at putting solar panels on top of the closed portion that we have right now. Um, we have we're exploring some geothermal heat uh, um, aspects that we can implement inside the landfill itself. There's opportunities for some uh, wind power there, but uh, um, the only other way that, that that landfill itself will ever be used um, is somewhere down the road, a company's gonna come around and decide that they can mine that landfill and take out anything that's usable, whether it be plastics or metals or anything that can be used in the, a combustion. Um, but that's probably 30 years down the road, if not. Well, the only thing that recycler is those that pick it up for kickers. <laughs> of course, <laughs> I never do that, but you can see the metal or. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I believe it. Um, many years ago, I worked out at, at some of our canister sites at the time I was living with my parents. They threatened to buy me a motorcycle because I was coming home with all sorts of stuff. Every construction you've ever had in your life is still on the planet, the plastic ones. So I've been looking for. Um, 
like bamboo, like wooden tooth brushes. And the other thing is last night I saw a fascinating ad on TV from a company called Bite, B-I-T-E dot com, which is a tablet that you put in your mouth, it starts to foam, and then you brush your teeth. Because the ad says, a lot of toothpaste tubes are in the ocean. The two things that we can do that help if something makes it to the ocean from from our county, <laughs> <laughs> I will give it an award. Because <laughs> uh, anything waste wise that comes to us, if it's waste, it hits our landfill and it does not leave. Um, but personal uh, aside, um, so uh, talking unless there is any other initial, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about uh, education. Yes. About how much money is spent on that? And I do have to say, I know in the Twin Cities living there, all the education posted by the, the containers for recycling mm -hmm. didn't really impact mm -hmm. any stuff put in there. So I know in many cases that money is wasted. Mm -hmm. However, uh, when I moved here, even now when I'm driving, when I want to go to a recycling place to pick up my hair in Ely, there's no sign. And um, I I find it again and again, I will have everyone there. That's right. the assumption. So if you're going to move to another place, you can't ask for any way to It's like you don't exist to not important. Mm -hmm. And I do that. And I don't go on. But basically, there's no signage saying turn here mm -hmm. at all. But the other is when I get to the site, there's very little signage about a whole bunch of things. I mean, you can take it to the table. Mm -hmm. But like you were talking about the plastic bags. Yep. I don't see anything saying, I don't see anything like the information you posted there to post it. And you can put somewhere. On the time saying what you can recycle, what you can't, mm -hmm. I think would be really nice. And I think, again, not everyone's going to read, not everyone's going to take that, but the attempt is made to educate. Mm -hmm. um, the other, uh, in terms of education, um, you didn't mention batteries. And, you know, here I think I don't like them, but actually not. And with batteries, there's a proper way to dispose of them. Yes. And uh, I learned that a few months ago, and it's like, wow, oh, this information is out there. But I think the state puts it out there on how you were supposed to cover up certain areas of the batteries before destroying and depositing them, and it's supposed to take a good time. I really haven't seen any posts about that. Okay. Um, and the other is part of that education, too, is like, and, you know, we have a big shop and everything. I don't know if they donate space for public information. No, I think for that. But uh, basically, you know, a periodical will find out how to dispose of batteries, stuff like that. Not, not, not the usual stuff, but mm -hmm. that additional stuff that, you know, is basically hazardous. Because that's how I knew that about the batteries. I saw it, and then because I thought, you know, the little, you know, triple A and A and B letters. Yep. Um, it depends on the type of bag. The, Sorry. Okay. Um, the double A, triple A, things like that. You don't have to cover those. Uh, it, it's the, the flat button batteries, those lithium ions that uh, cause issues. And those have to go through a helpful hazard waste program. The, the standard double, triple A, those go in the garbage. I'm mindful of the time, and so I want to give Stephen a chance to wrap up according to your preferences. Sure. You, you know, if you have time to stay longer, I just want to acknowledge that we've passed the one o'clock hour. Um, let me just punch through these really quick. Then. We had so many eager questions. Oh, and I love answering questions. I like to put in the quote because I think this is important that you put it on our uh, community TV. This is, I, I taped this today and I would upload it to our community. That's something I haven't explored before and I will make. Oh, this is so informational oh. as you present it today. 
but then it'll then it'll go up. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is actually on the county environmental services website, um, but uh, having it on public access would probably be a good idea. Um, so let's fire through some of these a little bit. Uh, um, that sorting process. Um, after these guys grab a a piece of material, they throw it down a hole. Um, that hole ends up down in a cage here where each one of these containers has one type of product. You can really see the aluminum cans here. Next to that pin, then you've got your two plastics. There we go. Um, once they're sorted there, they end up going up a line and into a baler that kicks out cubic yard brick. Um, those cubic yard bricks then are loaded onto a semi and sold off to any sort of end market. Um, um, so like I said, where material goes, glass stays on site, creates that class, that glass five. Uh, we sell our plastics um, and thin and aluminum right now to a company called Republic Services. They are, I believe, the second largest waste management company in the country. Um, both doing uh, garbage service, but they also do recycling and they'll, they buy our product, combine it with theirs and sell that to different end markets. Uh, and aluminum to Republic. Our paper products go to a place called In Solution Manufacturing. I think they've changed names now to Heartland. Um, but they're in the Baxter area where they take this product and turn it into cellulose blown insulation. Uh, cardboard ends up going to a company called Liberty Paper in the Becker area, where they take that cardboard, reconstitute it, and make the little wavy bit that's in the middle of cardboard. Um, that, that's where new cardboard goes when it's recycled, is that specific wavy bit. Um, Getting into some things not accepted in the recycling program, aerosol cans, um, yeah, they're metal, um, but there's usually something in them. Those have to go to a ha hazardous waste facility. We've got two permanent facilities in Virginia and Hibbing, and periodically through the summer, we have remote collections in other uh, farther flung areas of the county. Uh, plastic bags, we have box, uh, a bit about plastic bags, and I can talk about the horror stories of those all day long. <laughs> uh, plastic toys, dishes, and hangers. They are not accepted as recyclable because we do not know the resin type for them. Usually it's a number step, so it's not a material that we can work with in our process. Uh, motor oil containers, yes, they're a number two. Um, but the residual oil that's in the container, even once you pour it into a vehicle, um, fouls the recycling process at an end mark. And so please throw those in the trash. Aluminum foil. Um, we talked about aluminum cans and how great they are. Aluminum foil is a little bit of a, an outlier. Um, if that were to enter a recycling process, it's actually so thin that it burns and evaporates before it melts down. Um, and so that's not something that's considered recyclable and should go into the garbage. Uh, not saying that it won't be recycled in the future. I alluded a little bit to future companies coming back and maybe mining a landfill. Um, it's happening in other parts of the state, and, or not other parts of the state, other parts of the country and the world um, where companies are mining those landfills. So eventually it'll get to us. Um, the materials with food contamination. Um, the other one, we tried doing carton recycling. Uh, your, think your milk cartons or um, uh, chicken stock. Uh, we tried recycling those. Um, it didn't work. Uh, after a year and a half, we only accumulated six bales of that material, and we really need to have a full semi load. Um, but in the 18 months it took to make those six bales, those six bales decomposed on site. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not something that we can do. Yes. You mentioned that Ellie with it, the uh, milk cartons, the milk and the yeah. other. If I remember correctly, there is a pitcher somewhere 
I've been, and I've been trying to scrub those. I've, I've been trying to scrub those images oh. all over the place. Um, thanks for letting me know that Ely still has one because I'll get right back. Um, I think actually that slide was in somewhere around. Um, so that I think we covered pretty much the rest of that. Um, so here's my contact information. I love being a resource for folks whenever possible. Um, so if you've got a question, there's my direct phone number and my email. Um, please feel free to use them as you need them. Yes, sir. Are your uh, buyers using the one? So the number one plastics um, usually end up becoming carpets, um, or these wonderful reusable bags that uh, I've handed out to you folks. That's 100% recycled PET. The number two plastic um, end up being like edging for a garden or a, uh, a culvert pipe. Um, they're not necessarily made back into a food grade plastic, but they are turned into something that can be used somewhere else. Yes, sir. Do you, do you have any um, participation stats that indicate what level of participation participated in this? I don't. Do you I, have a guess? I put it somewhere in the neighborhood uh, um, of about 10%. Mm -hmm. but, but that's purely related to the tonnage when you look at what comes in as garbage versus what comes in as recycled. I'd like to pump those numbers up a bit, um, but getting back to the education, when I came on with the county, the education budget was somewhere in the neighborhood of $60,000. Um, that has shrunk over the last six years to about $40,000. Um, and unfortunately, I've gotten a little jaded because being the person that does all the advertising, I, I see exactly how much time I spend screaming into the ether for people to do things properly and how many people don't pay any attention to it. Uh, so uh, the signage thing, uh, in a perfect world, I would have signs everywhere telling people, put your recycling here, do this here, do this here, do this here. 85% um, of people would look at that. This is part of this. Okay. Yeah. Um, in that case, you need to talk to the city of Ely because that would be a, a function of their uh, probably public works or road department. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I'll, I have a question here and I'll get to you, sir. Yes. Getting back to the pickers, public works are used to the uh, an area where they had usable items where they could pull, pick them up, people if they could use them, they could pick them up. But now they don't do that anymore. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, um, that was a function of people abusing it, um, particularly at the main landfill in Virginia. Um, we used to have a, a system where somebody could come in, sign a little waiver, and they'd get about 15 minutes to go and peruse the scrap metal pile. Um, at the regional landfill, the scrap metal pile ended up looking like an anthill. People would spend hours there. And from a liability standpoint and a safety standpoint, we had to end that. And when we ended that, it became, well, get ready to appear. we got to end it everywhere. So both for the scrap metal and for that reuse portion, unfortunately, some bad actors took away the, the opportunity for everybody else. Why we can't have nice. <laughs> yeah, even what you have to have the knowledge of the percentage of people that recycle and how do we do compared to other counties? You know, piggybacking off of this gentleman's question, yeah. um, I estimated as about 10%. It's probably maybe closer to 20, um, especially considering that things are constantly getting lighter and thinner, uh, where I can't really make a one to one relationship with tonnage. 
Um, we, every year we have to do a report to the state where we talk about our recycling rate. Uh, when you factor this program in with the scrap metal appliances, tires, the uh, household hazardous waste, TVs, mattresses, all that stuff that recycles somewhere, it doesn't end up in the landfill, um, we end up with a recycling rate of 50%. Uh, the metro area of the state has a requirement where I think by 2035, they have to be 75% or more recyclable. And, and, and that's purely talking country. Uh, I don't know that any of them are anywhere near that. The greater parts of the state have a requirement by 2035 where we need to be 35% recyclable. So we are well above and beyond that as St. Louis County. In no small part, thanks to the mines, because they report to me every year the amount of scrap metal that they recycle and tires um, and other products that goes to a scrap dealer or something somewhere. Um, so that gets incorporated into our total recycling rate. So we're doing pretty good. From the individual recycling perspective, uh, everything that I covered today, um, I'd love to have more people jump onto it, um, but with no mandate uh, or any real financial incentive to do that, other than if you're going to reduce the amount of waste you put in a bag, then that's charge two dollars for. That's not there. Um, but anyway. Uh, I can stick around for another 20 minutes or so if anybody's got any questions. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for having me.